who are joining us from our sanctuary or from home. My name is Stephanie Haug, and my husband Stephen Weller and I have been members of this church. Well, we dated a little bit to the birth of our twin daughters, so I think it's 22 years now. We are very pleased to welcome both a guest preacher and a guest musician today. Playing the organ and directing the choir today is Justin Brueggemann. Welcome back, Justin. And preaching today is Reverend Ingeborg Haug, a community minister at First Church. She is a retired UCC clergy and family therapist. She grew up in Germany, which you may hear in her accent, although she denies it. She studied at Tübingen University, and she is a welcomed member of this community. Reverend Ingeborg Haug also <laughs> happens to be my mom. <clears throat> and she has taken care of us both physically and spiritually throughout our lives, has been a guiding force and support for Steve and I, married us 26 years ago, and continues to be a wonderful presence for both of our daughters. And I'm very pleased that she's here. Let us continue our worship in song. Let us pause and become vulnerable with ourselves and with God. Let us consider our needs for mercy, healing, and peace, and continue to make a space in our hearts for God's grace and courage and love and light. In this time of silence and through our sung prayer, Open your hearts to God.
Dear friends, listen to this good word news. Even now, the Spirit is at work, giving us new life and new hope. Mercy and peace are God's gifts to us. Receive this gift with thanks and share it with the world, offering your neighbor a sign of Christ's peace. Peace be with you, First Church.
Good morning, First Church. On a warm, sunny, maybe too warm day, thank you for being here and for creating our community together. Let us pray. Living God, you meet us in unexpected places and surprise us with the abundance of your love. Feed us by your word and fill us with your spirit so that we may follow you this day and always. In Jesus' name, amen. The first reading for this Sunday, by my choice, is 1 Corinthians 13, verses 12 through 13. For now we see through a glass darkly, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Our second reading is Psalm 139. It is probably also well known to you. And uh, particularly the first verses. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. This well-known psalm has been adapted and written poetically by Reeve Lindbergh, who is actually the wife of uh, Charles Lindbergh, or was. Uh, and I like this uh, adaptation. It gives it a new sound and a new message, but it is the same psalm. Some of you may know this, as I realize now. So here's Psalm 139. Lord, you look at me and know me. Every step I take, you show me. When I rise and when I rest, you will always know me best. Where I walk or sit or stand, you still hold me in your hand. And if I don't know how to pray, you understand me anyway. Once when I was lost, you found me. Then I felt your arms around me. When I'm afraid and want to hide, you're always by my side. When I'm lonely, you are near. When I'm angry, you stay here. High as heaven bright, you greet me. Down in darkness, too, you meet me. You are with me everywhere, in light and shadow, fire and air, in every tiny grain of sand, and in the desert, vast and grand. On morning wings, <clears throat> in oceans deep, when I'm awake and when I sleep, in my secret, secret self, you made me, in the blazing sun, you shade me. Know me, lead me, guide my way through every hour of every day. For all my life, in all I do, I will always be with you. Well, this text, I'm sure, was also very well known to Dietrich Bonhoeffer who is one of my heroes. Many of you know him, I'm sure. He was born, 1906 actually, in a pretty ar academic, aristocratic family of eight children. His father was an eminent psychiatrist and neurologist. All his older siblings uh, were very distinguished already in their careers, mostly lawyers. He decided at a very early age to study theology, and he did so in Tübingen, my alma mater, and in Berlin. And he wrote his doctoral thesis at the age of 21, clearly a bright and gifted and promising man, 
precocious maybe even. He served as vicar uh, to German congregations in Barcelona and in London, and later also studied at New York City's Union Seminary and taught uh, at Berlin University. So clearly he was not only learned, but he was also um, sophisticated, had seen different cultures, had seen different people, had a very broad understanding of different people's lives in different countries. So his life changed dramatically when the Nazis came to power. And within months, really, they militarized Germany, curtailed democratic freedoms, mainly the freedom of speech and assembly, and they issued all these Aryan racial policies that vilified and persecuted Jewish citizens. Not only Jewish citizens, but anyone who was uh, mentally challenged, physically challenged, uh, those were people uh, that were, uh, yeah, persecuted. And even the Protestant church came under the Nazi influence and was transformed into a Reichskirche, into a, a German church that left the world and world affairs to the Nazis and only considered uh, spiritual themes uh, within their congregations. Bonhoeffer didn't see it that way. He understood the gospel as being involved in life, in this life, not just with spiritual matters, but in everyday decisions, everyday, even politics. So he joined the resistance. With others, particularly also Martin Niemöller, if anyone knows of that name, he founded a alternate church called the Confessing Church. One of their first statements was a declaration in 1934, I believe, where they embraced all of the citizens, all of humankind, and spoke about God's love not being parsed out to certain people, Aryans, or not. So he created this confessing church, they called it, and also an underground seminary to train theologians uh, to be uh, pastors. When war seemed unavoidable, Bonhoeffer first escaped military service by following a call to teach at Union Seminary. Um, he could not become an, a, a conscientious objector, by the way. Uh, someone asked me that recently. No, because conscientious objectors on the book were permitted, but they were clearly executed, uh, imprisoned and executed. So he escaped military service by going to the United States. However, only a few weeks later, he decided he couldn't do that. He could not avoid what was happening in Germany. And this was now very close to World War II, when uh, the propaganda and the atrocities had really become much more severe and visible. He decided that he could not be safe in the US while Germany, his family, underwent such cruel, cruel um, uh, times. And he also wanted to be ready after the war to be able to help reestablish a church, a Protestant church. So um, he came back uh, to Germany just uh, as the war uh, began. And his brother-in-law, who worked in the, uh, it was called Abwehr, in the military uh, police, kind of like a, a secret, secret service, which was instituted and, and left alone for a long time, where he supposedly his international contacts 
on paper were going to help influence other nations so that he could travel to Sweden, to London, to influence the view of Germany, to improve uh, Germany's image abroad. However, unbeknownst to most people at the time, this military police was a cell of resistance, of conspiracy to eliminate Hitler, who they saw as the downfall not only of Jews, people, culture, the whole of, of uh, a life worth living. So, uh, in fact, another question I was asked at one time, how come they were going to kill Adolf Hitler and not just take him prisoner, you know, kind of get him out of the way, establish a, a, a new government? That was impossible because one of the things that the Nazis had done is that everyone in military service, from the highest officer to the lowliest uh, 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 foot soldier, had to swear the oath not to the government, not to a constitution, but a personal oath to Adolf Hitler. And if you know one thing about Germans, they take those things very seriously. Uh, so there was just it was more or less impossible to think about apprehending Hitler. So they started plotting how Hitler could be executed, killed. Now, in his writings on ethics, uh, Bonhoeffer touched on this subject, but as you may know, um, any writing was very suspicious and could be getting you into trouble. So there's very little about his conflict about this, how he dedicated to the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, negotiated that he had, as a Christian, to take a position, and not acting was acting. And that was not a position he could take. So he did join uh, the... Uh, conspiracy, and actually he became a spy for the resistance in his position. Now, Bonhoeffer was 37 years old when he was taken into custody in April of 1943. So the war had been started in 39, the war had been going on, and here he was, uh, he was apprehended. Actually, it was only uh, a few months after his engagement to Maria von Wedemeyer. Um, at first, the charges seemed very minor. Actually, he and his brother-in-law, uh, Hans von Donani, had helped Jewish uh, citizens to leave Germany via Switzerland, which at that time they could do legally, but what they could not do legally was uh, get financial resources, money for them. So somehow, there were some murky financial uh, dealings, and on that account, both von Donani and Bonhoeffer were, uh, were incarcerated. So initially, the charges seemed minor, more administrative, um, and it only later came to light that he was involved and knew of the plot to kill Hitler. As the war raged on, the prison conditions became more and more abhorrent. Dirty cells, often with no or little sunlight, verbal abuses and mistreatment from wardens, foul food, humiliation, gruesome interrogations, agonizing screams of prisoners who were led to their execution and exposure to bombing raids without any shelter. The few visits from his family and his fiancé and the small gifts they were able to bring, I guess particularly cigarettes, uh, lightened his days. But most days he was restless and had basically only paper and pen and wrote. He wrote many letters. Some of them are preserved, 
and he was finally able to befriend some wardens who helped smuggle some letters uncensored out of prison. Letters to his parents and his bride, but particularly to his longtime friend and collaborator, Eberhard Bethke. So Eberhard Bethke later collected the letters and published them in a book that's called, in English, called Papers and Letters from Prison. The German title is Widerstand und Ergebung, which means resistance and surrender. And both are uh, big facets of Bonhoeffer's lives. So in his letters to his parents and his bride, he assures them again and again that he's well. He, every once in a while, can listen to some music. He reads the Bible faithfully. He feels soothed by their letters and infrequent visits. However, in a letter dated about uh, seven months after he was incarcerated, a letter that was smuggled out uncensored uh, from, uh, to Eberhard Bethke, he confides that conditions in his prison cell are abhorrent and that he is fearful of getting dispirited and ready to give up. He's, he writes, despite everything I have written so far, everything here is too awful for words. I often ask myself who I really am. Am I the man who keeps squirming under the ghastly experiences in abysmal misery? Or am I the man who outwardly pretends to others and even to himself that he is a contented, cheerful, easygoing fellow and expects everyone to admire him for it? <laughs> I mean, admire him for this theatrical show, for that is what it really is. This was a, a private letter written to Eberhard Bethke. But half a year later, he formulates it into a, a poem and that ends up being a prayer. It's a, a searching confessional poem called, Who Am I? Who am I? They, they often tell me I step out of my cell calm and cheerful and poised, like a squire from his manor. Who am I? They often tell me I speak with guards freely, friendly and clear, as though I were the one in charge. Who am I? They also tell me I bear days of calamity serenely, smiling and proud, like one accustomed to victory. Am I really what others say of me? Or am I only what I know of myself? Restless, yearning, sick, like a caged bird, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, struggling for life breath as if I were being strangled, starving for colors, for flowers, for birdsong, thirsting for kind words, human closeness, shaking with rage at powerless and pettiest insult, tossed about waiting for great things to happen, helplessly fearing for friends so far away, too tired and empty to pray, to think, to work, weary and ready to take my leave of it all. Who am I, this one or the other? Am I this one today and tomorrow another? Am I both at once, before others a hypocrite, and in my own eyes a pitiful, whiny weakling? Or is what remains in me like a defeated army, fleeing in disarray from victory already won? Who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, Thou knowest me, O God, I am thine. Very much like Psalm 139, you're always with me. Bonhoeffer wrote this poem days before the failed assassination attempt of Hitler by the military officers 
which happened on July 20, 1944. In the aftermath, papers came to light which implicated Bonhoeffer in the conspiracy and sealed his fate. Three days before the end of the war in April 45, he was hanged on personal orders by Hitler. His parting words are reported to have been, this is the end, for me, the beginning of life. Dietrich's anguish in prison is palpable. It's disturbing. It gets under our skin. Unbelievable conditions, unbelievable uh, experiences. His situation is definitely unbearable and unique. It is really not comparable what we are all facing, and yet many of us are facing times of crisis, difficult circumstances, losses, betrayals, others than our own, and we come face to face not only with who we want to be and the face we want to show to our fellow parishioners, friends, our social network. We come face to face with that we are not always who we would like others to see us. In Bonhoeffer's words, calm and cheerful and poised, friendly and clear, serene, smiling and proud. But we realize that within us are other voices, other feelings, other thoughts of negativity, despair, anger, maybe vengefulness, sadness, maybe even shaking with rage as Bonhoeffer expresses it. Many feelings we are not very proud of and we try to hide from ourselves. And yet, we say, I'm fine, when people ask us how we are, even though we feel far from fine. We carry on with our exterior lives, even as we feel a disconnect between the person we present to the world and the inner turmoil. Yes, we do have a public face, a persona is what others have called it, uh, Jung had called it, how we appear to others and who we want to be. And yes, we have a private face. We have an interior life that often contradicts our calm exterior. And this honesty to face our interior voice and life thoughts and feelings which we oftentimes label as shameful, we want to run away from, we are embarrassed, we blame others or circumstances and wallow in our critical and condemning self-talk. We all know this. We all have this other, sometimes accusing voice within us. Bonhoeffer names and faces his inner turmoil with courage and humility. He does not shrink from it. He doesn't hide it away. He says, they mock me these lonely questions. And yet, is it really an either or? Is it not for all of us a both and? No, we are not fake when we are in our competent public selves, mm. and no, we are not a hypocrite when we acknowledge that there is this other part of us. Actually, the Romans had a saying, I'm human, nothing human can be alien to me. I actually looked it up. Mm. In Latin it says, homo sum humani nihil a me alienum puto. Everything that's human rests within me, which also means I cannot be superior to others. We all share in this human, uh, being human, and we all are capable of holding the whole scale of human emotions. This is who we are. 
We are human. We can be clear and calm and at other times muddled. We can be generous and stingy. We can be loving and vengeful. We are capable of it all, given the circumstances. One does not have to exclude the other or make us a hypocrite. So Bonhoeffer is faced with this conflict and how to get out of it, how to transcend it. Um, he shows the way. First, he confides in his friend Eberhard Bethke. He brings outside that which is eating him up inside. Once we speak about our inner voices, our, our private selves, to a, confident, to a confidant, to a trusted friend, to a pastor, to a therapist, to a neighbor, a fellow parishioner. Once we bring outside that which is eating us up inside, when it meets the light of day, it changes. What we look at changes and we can relate to it. We are now in a dialogue with another person. And in Bonhoeffer's case, the person was inviting. And that is one option. But we are facing where we are and we are accepting it as is rather than wanting to change it. But as we face what we hold secret, we change in relation to it. We exist in dialogue, all of us. We need one another. And I believe that this constitutes what Martin Luther used to call the priestdom of all believers that that is what we can be for each other. Mm. Uh, priestly, helpful, being available for what goes on with, within us. Second, so the first is he brings it out in the open. He confesses, he confides to his friend. Uh, second, uh, a little detour. Bonhoeffer once described life to his friend as a polyphonic composition with God's love as the cantus firmus. The way I understand this is, you know, in, in medieval music, they had one line that was weaving, didn't change much. Uh, it was the cantus firmus, the clear voice that stayed, sometimes a chord. And around us, the voices, the melodies would weave, sometimes happy, sometimes dark. And, and this is um, how Bonhoeffer, in this image, saw life, our lives, his life. Uh, the basic contest of our lives will carry us through, and also for his life. And again, this contest firmness stays firmly. Sometimes I've thought about this like a relationship between partners, or maybe even better, between a parent and a child. There is unconditional love between parent and child, generally. And yet, over it sometimes, the melody today, I may be angry at my child, I may be upset, I may be annoyed, and then I may be proud. So the melody might change, but it doesn't change the cantus firmus. It doesn't obliterate. It doesn't obliterate it. Faith is not wiped out by doubts and by fears. So who am I, Bonhoeffer asks? Not either or, that cannot be the answer, either this or that. He turns from his inner accusing monologue to a dialogue. Not only the dialogue with, with Eberhard Bethke, but he turns to God in very personal terms. God is a you to him, in whom he lives and dwells and has his being, as Paul might 
uh, would say. He's face to face with you, my God, a personal God. Now, he's not asking to be relieved of his confusion, but he relinquishes control with a deep outbreath, I would imagine, and he ends in prayer. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, I am thine. I live in relationship and in trust and in safety with you, my Cantus Firmus. You know me as thoroughly as expressed in our psalm. You know me, and I do not have to hide. And even though now, as we read earlier, we may see darkly, there will be when we see brightly and clearly. Reflecting on Bonhoeffer's life and faith, I'm reminded of a poem attributed to Rabbi Shapiro, and it's named God's Love. And even though I realize the time, I'm still going to uh, read it to you. Because it expresses a lot, and I love it, and it really, hopefully, maybe, may also speak to Bonhoeffer's um, attitude. We are loved by an unending love, we are embraced by arms that find us, even when we are hidden from ourselves. We are touched by fingers that soothe us, even when we are too proud for soothing. We are counseled by voices that counsel us, even when we are too embittered to hear. We are loved by an unending love. We are supported by hands that uplift us, even in the midst of a fall. We are urged on by eyes that meet us, even when we are too weak for meeting. We are loved by an unending love, embraced, touched, soothed, and counseled. May we be for each other God's arms, fingers, and voices. May we be mindful of serving as God's hands, eyes, and smiles. We are loved by an unending love. Amen. Amen.
again to the First Church in Cambridge, and thank you once again to Reverend Ingeborg and to Justin for so beautifully leading us in worship today. And as always, a special welcome to all who might be visiting today in person or online. We hope that you will join us on the front lawn after our service for a time of refreshments and conversation so we can get to know you better. And while you're there, consider stopping by our pastoral care card table where you can write a card to someone on our prayer list. I've received cards from several of you over the past couple of weeks, and they've really meant a lot to me. So thanks to all of you who have been taking part in this summer card ministry. It's really a great way to let folks like me know that they are in all of our hearts. Today we'll also be offering another of our summer sermon reflections out on the lawn, a chance to get to know a few of our community ministers better this summer. Help yourself to some refreshments and join Ingeborg today on the lawn for a time of informal conversation about her message today. And then, at 3 o'clock, former First Church Ministerial Associate Jazz Buchanan will be ordained to Christian ministry at United Parish Church in Brookline. And we are all invited to celebrate with her. Details about that service are in your bulletin. Congratulations to our beloved Jazz for this milestone moment in her ministry. Finally, this is our last, repeat last, 11 a.m. worship service for the rest of the summer. Next week, and for all of July and August, worship will begin at 10 a.m. Repeat, worship shifts to 10 a.m. starting next week. You can come at 11, but it won't be as enriching, perhaps. <laughs> These are all our announcements today, but of course the bulletin, as usual, is chock full of information about the ongoing life of our community during this time of pastoral transition. And as always, if you have questions about anything that you read or anything else First Church related, just ask somebody. If we don't know, we'll figure out somebody who does. Always happy to make a new connection. And now... Our service continues with prayer, so let us quiet our hearts. God be with you. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this life we share. We thank you for the breath of your spirit moving through us here at First Church, touching our hearts, deepening our connections, drawing us closer in community in all the ages and stages of life we find ourselves in through all of our learning, our passages, transitions, adventures, struggles, our times of doubt, and our times of rebirth. God, in every moment, your spirit is with us, weaving the threads of our lives into your tapestry of love. Help us to receive each other as your priceless gifts to us, O oh God. Remind us each time we gather to slow down and see each other's faces, to gaze on each other with gentleness and grace. For your image shining in each one of us, God, we thank you and we bless you. We praise you in light and we praise you in shadow. We praise you in joy and we praise you in times of trouble, for you are who you are through all the changes and upheavals of history. Help us to trust your goodness more than our self-doubt. Help us to trust your goodness 
more than our own grief or disappointment. Help us to trust your goodness more than the fears that crowd and jostle inside us. God, in those moments when we feel the tidal pull of despair tugging at us, call us back to faith again. Call us back to yourself again. Help us to simply be today. Souls quieted, spirits awake and listening, hearts resting in Jesus who is here with us even now in resurrection life, closer even than our own breath. We join our voices with his as we pray the words he taught us, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, let us honor God with grateful hearts knowing that nothing belongs to us alone. All that we are and all that we have are but gifts to be shared. Let us do so now with joy and freedom in our hearts. The morning offering will now be given and gratefully received.
and gracious God, for the gift of this community, we give you thanks. Accept our offerings and guide us to use them to bring love and justice to this neighborhood and also to the wider world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May we have courage. May we hold fast to what is good. May we return to no one evil for evil. May we have the wisdom to strengthen the faint-hearted and support the discouraged. May we help the suffering and honor all people. And may we live in God's Holy Spirit and grace, our country's firmness. Amen. Amen. Thank you.